And a fine good morning to everyone. Russ Barkley, back again with another Saturday ADHD Research Review. Hope you like the shirt, getting ready for Christmas. I know on your end, it's probably vibrating and sparkling, but hey, that'll keep your attention, won't it? So, uh, first of all, I want to thank Ben for sending me an app that allowed me to screen out some of the ads from the sites where I was getting dad jokes. So he's harvested a bunch of dad jokes and put them into an app where there's no advertising. So, hey, Ben, thanks so much for that. Let's get on to our dad jokes for the morning. So here's your first one. Why did the man put money in the freezer? I think you'll get this one. He wanted cold, hard cash. How about that one, huh? All right, next up, why didn't the number four get into the nightclub? Oh, because he was too square. I'm feeling sorry for that guy because I'm kind of square myself. Last up is going to be this one. Why is Peter Pan always flying? Because he never lands. Okay, gotta love that one, not to mention the laugh track from my new sound machine here. Hope you enjoyed that. We have four articles I want to talk about this morning that were published this week out of probably at least 25 or more. Many of those are doctoral dissertations or master's theses that wind up on the internet through their universities. I don't review those, as you know, because they're not peer-reviewed studies. Sometimes an article appears that is a pre-publication copy, but it too has yet to be peer-reviewed. I only do studies that are already published in journals and were likely peer-reviewed as a result. Just wanted you to know, and as always, I put the links to the articles in the description for those of you who want to pursue them further, keeping in mind that many articles are behind a paywall, so you may not be able to see the entire article, but you will be able to at least read the abstract. So first up is a very large meta-analysis of all of the neuroimaging studies that have looked at brain functioning and brain structure in people with ADHD. This study comes to us out of China, but of course, the research they're reviewing was done worldwide. They happen to have found 21 functional imaging studies and 50 studies of gray matter volume in the literature. They pooled it all together and did an analysis of the results. So this is, a, I think, a paper that shows us very robust findings. And of course, as you can imagine, they found a number of differences in brain functioning and brain structure between people with ADHD and those without. So, you know, this should put to rest any idea that ADHD is not neurological, not biological, that there's nothing wrong in the brain associated with ADHD. This paper finds a number of significant differences across brain regions. Let me just read a little bit from the abstract to give you some idea. This is going to get a little technical, and I'm sorry because you may not know where some of the brain regions are, but let's just quickly go through them. They've said that in general, individuals with ADHD exhibited increased resting state functional activity in the right parahippocampal gyrus. That's sort of over here in the central deep structure on the right side. They also found it in bilateral orbital frontal cortex. So there was a little bit more activity going on up here when they were in a resting state. And then they also found decreased functional activity while at rest in the bilateral cingulate cortex. That's sort of at the center part of the midline of the brain. And this included all parts of that cingulate cortex. Finally, when they were looking at gray matter volumes, they found that there was decreased brain size in the bilateral orbital frontal cortex right here in the right putamen, which is deep inside the brain, part of the basal ganglia, and in the left inferior frontal gyrus. They also found it in the right superior frontal gyrus, the anterior cingulate, and the precentral gyrus. So some areas are overactive during the resting state. They should not be so, but other areas are underactive 
And lastly, there is reduced brain volume within these specific regions. By the way, many of these areas link up into what we know as the executive function circuitry of the brain. So very important meta-analysis there out of China, published over in the journal Progress in Neuropsychopharmacology and Biological Psychiatry. Next up is a study of toddler screen time and risk for later ADHD and autism. This comes to us from the UC Davis Mind Institute over near Sacramento, California. They have a big institute studying autism. They're also studying its overlap with ADHD. One of my former students, now a professor out there, Julie Schweitzer, is also working on the overlap of ADHD and autism. So a very fine center of excellence out there at UC Davis. This study involves looking at 82 preschool children who were selected because they came from families where there was a high risk of either autism spectrum or ADHD disorders or both. And they compared children in this group to children at low risk for these disorders. They looked at them, first of all, at 18 months of age, <clears throat> and then they studied them more thoroughly between three and five, which is the point at which they made the determination of either ADHD, autism, or both. What they found is that in these participants with high and low family risk for disorder, the children who went on to develop ADHD or autism concerns experienced significantly more screen time, screen exposure at 18 months of age than did those at low risk for the disorder. So they're simply saying that we see that children who may later develop either of these neurodevelopmental disorders are more likely to have had a, a significantly higher amount of screen exposure when they were toddlers. Now, that doesn't mean that screen exposure is causing the risk. These children could easily have already been autism spectrum or ADHD at 18 months of age, but we can't make a sound determination of either disorder at such a young age. I also know both personally from having a grandson on the spectrum as well as professionally from working with families that many families with neurodivergent children, even when they're young, use screen time to help manage the children and to be able to buy some time to get other things done in the family because these toddlers often find screen time to be much more reinforcing to them and therefore more likely to occupy them when parents need to be busy. So it's, it's kind of like a bit of a babysitting device to allow us to get other things done when we need that child to be occupied. In any case, the study does not show any causal relationship between screen exposure as a toddler and causing ADHD and autism later. Just happens to be that it was later when they finally determined who had one of these neurodevelopmental disorders. So remember, correlation, as always, is not causation. You can interpret that relationship either way, and I'm sure any of you with personal experience with very young children with either of these neurodevelopmental disorders knows that screen time can be a savior to helping to get a little time from the child and to occupy them so you can get other things done. So <clears throat> time will tell how this turns out, but I, to me, that would be a more likely interpretation of these results. So uh, a nice paper involving uh, some preschool children there out of UC Davis. By the way, that was published over in Child Psychiatry and Human Development. Our third paper up for this morning was published over in Research and Developmental Disabilities. This one comes to us out of China, and it's a comparison of adolescents with ADHD to adolescents with ADHD and internet gaming disorder. And it compares these two groups on multiple lab measures of impulsiveness, inhibition, decision-making, reward seeking, and so on. All are various aspects of impulse control. And what they found is that the group that had internet gaming disorder besides ADHD was significantly more impulsive 
on all of the lab measures than was the group with ADHD alone. Now, the group with ADHD alone, of course, also has problems with inhibition, but it's even worse in those with internet gaming disorders, suggesting that the more severe the inhibitory deficits are in teens with ADHD, the more likely they are to be at risk for internet gaming disorder. In any case, very interesting paper. I would not seen a prior paper that made this kind of comparison. So uh, very nice study out of China there. Our last paper for this Saturday morning is going to be published over in Frontiers in Psychiatry. This is a multi-site study involving investigators at Howard University in Washington, D.C., also over in Ethiopia, in Massachusetts, uh, in Pakistan, Washington, D.C., and so on, as well as Baltimore, Maryland. This is a study that is looking at children and young adults with ADHD between 6 and 24 years of age who took stimulant medication and those who did not. And what they're looking for is the risk of these individuals for various heat-related adverse events. Okay, so what might those kinds of things be? Well, they would be things like dehydration, hyperthermia, heat stroke, and other heat-related conditions. And what did they find? They found that those who were taking stimulant medication had a significantly reduced likelihood of having any of these heat-related conditions compared to those not taking medication. Now think about that for a moment. Why would that be? We know that people with ADHD not on medication tend to not be as aware and attentive to their own self-care as other people are. And we know that if you're not paying attention to things like hydration and protecting yourself from the heat and being sure you don't over-engage in physical activity when it's particularly hot outside, there's a lot of things that we do as part of our self-regulation to maintain our health and well-being. And we know that people with ADHD are less likely to engage in that kind of self-care and self-awareness, except when they're on medication. And because of the normalizing or at least improving effects of the medication, it may make them more likely to be attentive to their own self-care, to be more aware of their own hydration and physical activity, and to take steps to not get themselves so at risk for these heat-related illnesses. That at least would be my interpretation of these differences. Well, all right, everybody, there you are. I hope you enjoyed this week's research review, uh, and we'll end with another sound effect. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Glad you liked the research review. Join me next week for another research review. Uh, and by the way, happy holidays to all of you, and I hope that you enjoyed this video. Please join me again next week. As always, be well, live well, and take care. Bye now.